semester. I'm uh, very glad to introduce to you Professor David uh, Fowey, uh, who will talk about uh, uh, understanding the physical world from images. Uh, David uh, has uh, completed his PhD at CMU with Marshall Ebert and Abhinav Gupta as advisors. And after uh, doing his postdoc at Berkeley, he has been faculty at the University of Michigan. And he has done uh, excellent uh, work uh, from uh, really also the uh, early days of understanding 3D from uh, uh, images uh, using actually uh, priors and uh, also introducing in a very creative way geometric concepts in uh, current uh, deep learning uh, pipelines like uh, transformers, as well as more recent work on uh, uh, really applying uh, uh, the most advanced computer vision work uh, on science applications. Uh, who is... Uh... All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And it's really great to be back uh, at Penn. And so I'm the one who's up here talking, but this is really joint work with my many students. And so they're not here, but you know, it's important to remember, remember them as well. Okay, so I wanna begin my talk with, and I'd love to begin my talk with a picture. And so here is a scene that you have not, probably not seen before. It's a place I've never been to. And I'd like each of you to imagine what you could do in here. Just like take five seconds and think of something you could do. So let's go over some options. Um, well, one of which is um, you might want to uh, uh, sit down. You might want to watch a talk. That sounds like a great thing. Uh, maybe it's a little too early in the morning. You might want to, for example, go back into the other room and there's a nice bed and that looks very nice and comfy. Hopefully you don't fall asleep during this talk. You might want to go outside. It looks very sunny. This is actually in Mexico and it's nice and warm. Um, and so you might want to enjoy the outdoors. But as you move around, you can do things like you can open this door over here. You can open the drawer if you wanted to, for example, find the TV remote to increase the volume or change the channel. And if you want to adjust this pillow behind you, which is going to light up in a second, you could imagine that you can move this around. And what I think is really amazing is that this is a place that nobody's ever been to. Um, and yet your understanding of the scene is so good that you can think about hypothetically doing all sorts of actions in 3D in the real world from this image. And this is a pretty amazing ability. And you're able to think about not only moving about the scene, but also manipulating things and changing the scene. And you can do it from an image. And so this amazing ability is basically what the goal of my research is. I, I'd love to have computers have the ability to understand the world at a human level or better, and really understanding it in the 3D sense, as well as also interaction and really going beyond as well. And so I'm gonna talk about three main things that I work on, um, and sort of like the three classic directions I've worked on today. And the first one is understanding um, 3D scenes. Let me actually just close some of these so that we have, you do not have stuff blocking the titles. Uh, that's better, okay. So understanding 3D scenes. So I have a path out to the outdoors and this path goes on top of the floor and you can't see the floor. And whenever I show these examples, no one sort of jumps up and says, you know, your example doesn't make sense. You're going through space that is obviously a hole in the floor. The fact of the matter is the floor is there behind the chairs and then behind the tables and lots of other paths. You can even happily imagine walking into um, the other room and you can't see the floor there, but you know it's there. And you have a good sense of what the bed is behind that wall. And so I'm interested in trying to understand the invisible surfaces as well. And this is something that you can't get from a laser scanner. So here's an output of one of our systems. Um, this has not been trained on the output and the video quality is a little low, but you, you'll be able to see sort of, you should be able to see that it's able to get a 3D reconstruction. And the system has been trained on, not on hotel rooms, but rather sort of indoor scenes of people's houses. And you can get a reconstruction that looks relatively reasonable and there's sort of point clouds for the, uh, for the chairs and there's like a floor behind the chairs as well. The other thing that I've, I'm interested in, and you can imagine that a sensor like that, which could reconstruct the invisible surfaces would be useful for robotics, is I've become very interested in understanding like who can work with computer vision. And the sort of classic answer for me at least was robotics. I went to a robotics department, I love robotics. And that was always my answer. I wanna have computer vision help robotics. But I think thinking more broadly, computer vision has lots of useful things to say for lots of other fields. And so I'm gonna to talk today about using the entire idea of like measuring things, like for example, how big is this? Or 
um, you know, what's the vector here? And I'm going to talk about this using it for fields that you probably haven't thought about. Like, for example, evolutionary ecology, where we're measuring bird bones. And then solar physics, where essentially uh, we're estimating things like vectors on the sun, which is, which is a lot of fun. And I think this is, I think, going to be an increasingly large, important role for computer vision to play. And sort of working with these fields. Um, the last thing is I'd love to be able to understand interaction. And by that, like, you can imagine everything you can do here. Like, if you had, like, for example, a toddler walking to the scene, and cause havoc. There's so many things that, that could happen. Like the number of possible actions they could take is amazing. Um, and I'd love to have computers have that same level of understanding. And of course, this is a long-term goal, but what I've been fo focusing on is trying to build an understanding of what human hands are doing in the present so that we can, in the future, figure out what they could do. So I'm trying to, we've been building systems that enable understanding the current state of the hands, and the goal is then later to be able to synthesize, okay, if I have a drawer, for example, I know how to manipulate it. Um, and so, but to, in order to get there, we first need to build the basic systems. So those are the three sort of things I'm gonna talk about. And I'm just gonna jump right into the first one, which is building reconstructions. And so this is work with my, primarily done by my uh, student, Nilesh Pulkarni, as well as our, his co-advisor, Justin Johnson. And then Linny has joined uh, for a more recent paper, which is under submission. And we'd like to take an image like this that you haven't seen before. And um, we'd like to produce a reconstruction like this. And so this is a point cloud. The colors are the different depths. And one thing you'll notice is this is from a slightly different view. So you can see the back of the counter or the back of the cabinet, even though you can't see it in the original image. So we're producing a reconstruction like this. Now, some of the surfaces are not quite precisely correct, but it's getting a good general adjusted scene. And it's doing this from a single RGB image that it's never seen before. So let me actually rotate this. So here it should start rotating and you're getting a reconstruction that looks a bit like this. And so, you know, there's some extra points floating around. Some of the stuff in the far background is a little creative, but it's able to get the gist of the scene quite nicely. And we'd like to be able to do this from a single image. And you can imagine this would be a useful ability for lots of uh, autonomous agents. So I've been working on 3D reconstruction for a very long time. And the first thing that people tended to do was you, you would build things with voxels and meshes. And if you play with these, you know that they fit in very nicely to deep nets. Um, and deep nets love fixed size outputs, but they really don't, you can't scale things up. You can't build a scene level reconstruction simply from predicting a big voxel grid. This just doesn't work very well. Um, so the thing that's become very popular is implicit functions. And the, the idea basically is that for every single 3D point in the scene, you can predict some property like the distance to the surface. And these have produced really amazing results. But the big challenge is that typically they don't work on new objects. So essentially people will fit an implicit function to a very specific scene. Or they, if they work on a new scene, they often need the, the sort of data that they fit on to be watertight. So some of you may know what a watertight mesh is, but I just wanna illustrate it for those who may not have seen it. And the idea behind a watertight mesh is that you have a notion of what's inside the object and what's outside the object. And it's watertight in the sense that if you sort of poured water into the mesh, the insides of the objects don't get wet. And meshes that you get from a conventional scanner tend not to be watertight. They're just kind of surfaces floating in, in 3D. And so here is like a bedroom from a Matterport scanner on the top right. And you say, hey, David, come on. I mean, I know the bed, there's the outside of the bed, the inside of the bed, but that's because you know it and you're a human. But the actual geometrically, it's not well-defined like what's an inside, what's an outside. And you can get watertight meshes, but you typically require an artist to create them, or you require a, a person who's scanning it to be very, very careful, or you have to solve multiple graphics PhDs in order to get watertight meshes from general scans. So the, the sort of stuff that you can get from like a consumer phone, like now these phones have lots of great LiDAR scanners, and this is really amazing. These are not necessarily going to be watertight. And so we'd love to be able to use this data of non-watertight meshes, but the catch is water tightness ends up being very important for a lot of methods. And so the goal that we, we tried to solve was we're going to try to reconstruct scenes, including invisible surfaces. And at test time, we have an image we've never seen before. And it's a single ordinary image, such as the one off your phone. And at training time, um, you, we're gonna have access to RGB, so the images, as well as non-water type meshes, or we also have a method which is under submission where you can just handle posed RGBD images. So basically just a bunch of random scans from a, from a uh, LiDAR, for example, that where we know the relative position. 
And the method here is going to be implicit functions because these have enabled great performance gain. For the, for the meshes. Uh, for multiple views, you have, you have, you'll have, so uh, the or should go, RGB is always, and then you should have a parentheses after the plus. So your supervision is, uh, you always need your input, and your supervision is either another RGBD image, or you have a, a, a mesh. Yes. And the method is going to be actually relatively de straightforward deliberately. Like, the, the point is we're not going to make the method extremely complicated. It's going to be based off of a very standard technique because what we're going to do is we're going to innovate on how we represent the 3D as opposed to building a bunch of orthogonal things into the method. And the idea here is you have an image, and this is what you start with. You don't have a 3D of the scene. You don't know where the counter is. This is, and if you don't do computer vision very much, it's important to remember that all the stuff that you see in this is not available really to the computer. So we have this image, and so what we do is we start out with a predefined grid. The grid is defined using just the camera intrinsics. We we don't fix it, we don't change it for image. We have a predefined grid, and I have a point in 3D, and this is a point X, and my goal is to predict the distance or some property at that location X in 3D. And what I do is I'm gonna project that point in 3D, and that is going to be, I'm gonna use information at the projection. And specifically, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go look inside a convolutional feature map. So this is, you can think of this, the deep network as simply providing some sort of feature for every single location in 2D. And for every single position in 3D, you can figure out what that, you know, what, where that projects to, and you can use the feature there. And you can put that into a deep network, and then you can predict, for example, the distance of the nearest surface for that point in 3D. And this is how a lot of things like pixel nerf work. If you've seen these before, this is how a lot of standard techniques work. So you're basically trying to predict in a predefined grid, essentially a big set of uh, the distances of the nearest surfaces. And what you get afterwards is you're going to get something like you get something where you have a grid of the unsigned distance function for all the points in 3D. And so you get this output, and so it's, you know, it's purple near surfaces, it's yellow far away. Now, this is kind of what you get as an output from the network. But the key thing is that no one actually wants this as an output. I mean, some people might. You can imagine this might be useful as a raw output. But really what happens is you need to take this and you need to turn it into surfaces. If I show up and I tell my sponsors I have a distance volume, they say, great. Can I get surfaces? And this, the first thing you always have to do is convert things to surfaces. And one of the key details is you actually need to decode this distance volume into surfaces. It's not, it's not necessarily trivial. So if I have, for example, one thing I could do is I could say if the distance to the nearest surface, I say everything that's within epsilon, that's a surface. Now, if you've played with computer vision for a while, you know that anytime you're thresholding something and someone says you have to define a constant epsilon, you know that you're in for a lot of trouble. So there are lots of different techniques people use. You have gradient descent. Lots of people have lots of different techniques for doing this. And the thing that people really want to use is they want to use a sine distance function. Because sine distance functions, there's a positive on the outside, negative on the inside, and you have a zero crossing. And the zero crossing is wonderful because it's just very easy to find. There are lots of great functions like marching cubes or finding zero crossing that just work really well on this. But if you don't have inside or outside, this is, you can't use a signed distance function. You're forced to use an unsigned distance function. So we tried this sort of recipe, and we tried to predict the unsigned distance functions in scenes. And poor Nilesh worked very, very hard and couldn't get this thing to work. And we discovered two things that I'm going to tell you today that make a huge difference when you're predicting these distance functions in 3D. And I think these lessons are actually kind of generally applicable. So these are two lessons that we learned the hard way that I hope you don't have to learn the hard way. So the first thing is that estimating distances and scenes is very, very painful for a deep network, and you should stop making them do it. So let's look at this um, red ray that goes through the scene. So again, this is a pixel in an image, so it corresponds to a ray going out to 3D. So I say, what's the distance function for the points along this ray? You say, oh, David, that's so easy. The ray intersects the oven. All I have to focus on is the oven, and I'm set. So let's look at this in 3D. So if I rotate out, so here's the scene again. The camera is in orange, and I can draw the ray. The ray goes out to the oven. Well, let's see. The network has to estimate the distance at all the points along this ray. This seems pretty easy. Just focus on the oven. Very nice, very nice. Let's look over here, and this is a bit of a lag. You have um, the, the uh, ray is going just past the counter. Well, what's the nearest point to the, the ray when it's going past the counter? Huh, 
actually it's on the counter. It's actually not on the object. And in fact, if I do the nearest neighbor to the array all throughout the scene, it's all over the place. And this nearest neighbor is what defines the distance to the nearest surface. And so you have, as the array goes over the counter, essentially the network has to focus very hard on the counter. As it goes near the other counter, it has to focus on that. As it gets to the oven, it can finally focus on the oven. And if you actually look at this image in 3D and in, in 2D and you reproject it, all of a sudden your network has to look everywhere. And this is the minimum it has to look. And so using scene distances forces the pixels feature to reason over large parts of the image, which is very tricky. So we have one trick which is that basically you have a, something called, we called it array distance. I now know in graphics, this is called a projected distance function. And the key is that you basically forget about the rest of the scene. You say, okay, if you are the array, all you have to worry about is intersections of the array and the scene. And the key thing here is that all the intersections will project to the pixel. So if you're the deep network, all you have to focus does on this single yellow dot that intersects the oven. It's you don't have to worry about anything else. This makes your life a lot harder, a lot easier. And so the networks learn a lot better. And this is one very, um, this is one generalizable thing that we learned from this project. And this consistently makes your, uh, the networks work better. So the other thing we learned is that when we ask the networks to predict things, they, we, we can often ask them to do things that are kind of nonsensical if we're not very careful. And I'm gonna illustrate this by sort of talking about array distance and talking about what we expect the networks to do. So here the array goes through the counter. And I'll just show you this as a diagram from above. And the idea behind this ray distancing is you can actually just think about this as a one dimensional problem. So rather than focusing on the 3D problem, you're focusing on the, the ray along a single one dimension. And we can just basically ignore the rest of the scene. We're just living in 1D land. And suppose the counter is at three meters and four meters. We'll come back to that in a second. You can basically think of this as you have a distance that goes along this ray and you have an intersection at three and an intersection at four. And your network's job is to predict the distance function on this ray. So the thing you'd love to predict is a sign distance function. Positive on the outside, negative on the inside. This works so well. It's amazing for, like, there's a reason why graphics people love these. Unfortunately, you don't have access to this. If you don't have a watertight mesh, you are out of luck. So what you're forced to use is an unsigned distance function. And this looks like a W. And your network, this sounds fine. Network should be able to represent it. It's piecewise, you know, it's piecewise uh, uh, linear. It's very nice. Now, the problem is, if you actually think about the network, the network is going from a single RGB image to 3D. This is a very challenging problem. And how certain are you that the, that counter is actually three meters away? You actually might be sort of, you have some sort of intrinsic uncertainty. If you're working on challenging data, you probably have to have this uncertainty. And so we can ask the question, what happens when the network faces the uncertainty in this problem? And so you might have a distribution over the possible locations for where that yellow intersection actually is. And so the unsigned distance function, if it's at three, is going to be this function that you saw before. If I actually move it a little bit further back, the distance function shifts over. And if I shift it backwards a little bit, well, now the distance function has shifted. And the network intrinsically has uncertainty about where that surface is, which makes it difficult for the network to predict. So what does a poor network do when it has this uncertainty? Now, you can actually sort of analyze this. And the optimum thing for the network to do is to produce the expected value. And this is, in some sense, the more data you get, if you scale up all the data in all the world, essentially what you're going to do is get increasingly good estimates of the expected value. And if you've played with deep networks and predicting things that are you know, painful to produce, like distance functions, you may have seen some weird pathological behavior when you have networks that do this. And so, for example, in colorization, you know, birds, they can be red, they can be blue, they can be orange. Um, and if you're trying to colorize a bird, there are lots of different colors for it. But on average, it's brown. The average color of a bird is brown. And so if you train a network with a mean squared error to produce the bird color, it's gonna say brown every single time. And a similar thing happens with predicting 3D, which is that the expected value is actually something which is pathological that you don't necessarily want. And we've actually did a whole bunch of math um, it's in an appendix. I hope, I hope people read it. It was a lot of fun to derive, but the, you know, it's a little too early to actually go through the derivations, but we actually have the, co the computations of what the expected values are for these distance functions. And you can see the paper. What I'll instead show you is that basically this W becomes a cursive W. And what's happening is that you're basically averaging over a bunch of non-negative values, and this will produce the fact that basically this function gets distorted like this. 
Now, there are a couple of things to note about the expected distance function. Um, one is that this is what the network should produce if it's trained optimally. So it's not like you can scale up the data and magically get, get rid of this. It, this is what the network will actually learn to produce. The second thing is that the intersection is no longer actually going to be, have a value of zero. And worse, it actually depends on how certain you are about the intersection. This is actually a little, this is a little pathological. So this is going to make thresholding very hard. The other thing is that the derivative is definitely not plus or minus one. And so basic things you assume about distance functions, like you know, they're zero at the intersection and their derivative is going to be one, well, they don't hold anymore. And so your network is incentivized to produce wrong outputs. And so you can actually look at the, um, uh, this is a function, and you can sort of control the uncertainty. Um, let's see how this goes. So basically, as you get very, very certain about the location, you recover essentially the original unsigned distance function. And as you get uncertain, the function sort of fluctuates up and up, up and down. And so you might ask, well, fine, fine, fine. You did all this math, so why don't we know about this in the, in the past? And you might say, well, what, what about like using um, an assigned distance function? Like, why don't you know, people talk about this? The reason is because if you actually do the same experiment with a sine distance function, what happens is it gets all messed up in between the intersections. But the thing is, for most sine distance function computations, you care about the intersections. So the network will produce all sorts of junk in the middle of your shape, but the actual intersections are largely untouched because what's happening is the positives and the negative components are canceling out. And actually what happens is if you talk to people who do things like produce medial axes, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is actually a very serious problem because in the middle of the, of the shape, things get really messed up by the function. So you can find surfaces very easily, even under uncertainty, if you have a water tank. So we have a trick. And um, hopefully, the geometers will not uh, kill us, because we, we're going to say we're going to give up on predicting distance functions. Our title, unfortunately, does still say distance function. We're going to say we're going to produce a distance-like function. The idea here is we have this w. We do something very simple. We find the direction to the nearest intersection. Red is um, the nearest intersection is after that location. Blue is the nearest intersection is behind. You can basically just cut up the space. And you make the distance either positive or negative. And what happens is you basically flip the, the, the distance function down. And so it's like the sine distance function. It has positive and negative components. So things cancel out nicely. But you don't need an inside or outside. In some sense, your, ins your positives and negatives are not defined by the shape. They're defined by the location of the camera. So you're just arbitrarily orienting the, the distance function. And you don't need the inside or outside. And you have this really, really nasty discontinuity in the middle that should make you feel like, oh, this is going to be very hard to fit. But the beautiful thing is if you're looking for the surfaces, who cares if the middle is messed up? So what happens is if you actually take the uncertainty near the intersections, this is extremely stable. In the middle, it's a complete mess, but we're not worried about the middle. And if you want to find the surfaces, you just look for positive to negative zero crossings. And this is relatively easy. And you have this extra phantom zero, zero crossing in the middle, but it goes from negative to positive, so you can filter that out very easily. Let me just show this. The uh, function gets distorted. But near the intersection, it's relatively stable. And so you can actually work out how stable it should be. So um, the thing is that you need to then be able to supervise the network to predict this. And so um, what we've done in the past, and I'm just going to give you a flavor of this, is you need to be able to take for every point x in 3D, you need to be able to provide supervision for that. And the standard thing that we first did is we, you can get a mesh and you can calculate this. This is the easiest thing. If you have a mesh, you can do array to mesh intersection test, get the distance, and everything is very easy. The other thing that I can't talk about, it's still like under embargo, our sponsors are reviewing it. I got one slide cleared, um, hopefully soon on archive. You can do this also with posed RGBD images. So if I have this scene, I can take a view from another camera. And I'm going to show you the general idea, um, soon to come out on archive, once it gets clearance. Uh, the idea is that you can look at it from a different view. And you can see, for example, large regions of free space that are visible in another camera's view. So we have an RGBD camera, so you know that certain regions are, are unoccupied. So you can look at this red ray from a, the other camera in the corner. And if you zoom in over here, the recipe, and if you want us or rush to beat us to archive, here's the recipe for the sketch. Um, some of the intersections are basically impossible due to free space. You can't have intersections in this purple region. You can actually think about the distance the nearest intersection tells you where an intersection would be. And so if I then say, OK, some distances at that point x in 3D are just impossible, because they would imply an intersection which I know can't possibly be there, because I can see it from another RGBD example. 
And so we have a way of deriving supervision, and it's a little bit more complicated because you, you can do a little bit more, and you can get more out of it than just sort of like an inequality constraint. But you can train a network with this, and you don't actually need to have meshes anymore, which is really cool because now you can have access to large amounts of consumer scan data. Okay, so in the end, what the method does is you can train the method to predict this distance function at every single location along in this 3D volume, and then you go through the rays and you find positive to negative zero crossing. And this is really dead simple to implement and really simple to produce outputs from. And here are some results. And so here is gonna be, um, see, it's rotating. So the first hit in the scene is colored with a normal image. So it's, this is uh, just like normal uh, RGB that you're used to. The back, the second hit, basically the parts that are occluded, these are colored with a surface normal. So it's red is, is sort of facing upwards and different purples are different vertical uh, surfaces. So this is an image we haven't seen before. This is from the Matterport 3D data set. And we're using the actual captures from the camera as opposed to some sort of re-render from a graphics engine. Here's another example of a kitchen. And so as it rotates around, you'll probably be able to see, um, it's a little compressed, but you always see there's a green spot as it rotates around and it's on the back of the counter. And that's a surface that is vertical and facing away from the camera. And we're able to recover that from, a, from an image, which is pretty neat. Now, of course, this kitchen is a little bit bendy, but um, these are things that are all fixable. And there are lots of orthogonal tricks in the depth map literature for basically making these surfaces a lot more straight. Yeah. Speaking of But when we have rays, usually the preferred density or optical. Why, why is it constant? Yeah, so um, the, uh, if you have the rays, you can definitely do an occupancy thing. What happens with the occupancy, so and we, we compared against this. Occupancy actually works quite well. You'll need to define a, uh, essentially, I'm within epsilon of a surface. And what happens with that is um, your uncertainty, this will, essentially what happens is the output that the network will produce is kind of like this convolution of like a, of like a sort of a boxcar function with your, with your Gaussian, this ends up being a little tricky to threshold as well. And then you also have these things where if you find the, you have to sort of look for two peaks and then you have to sort of take the, the middle of them, it ends up being a little tricky. And what happens is by having this ray, this distance thing, you can actually get um, very precise localizations of where the actual intersection is. Um, it's a little easier to detect basically. Um, yet we compare against them. I don't have, I don't have that that particular one in the uh, table, but it's in the paper. Let me just show you, just uh, to sort of show where we started and where we ended up. The top image is, top left is image, top right is ground truth. Um, bottom left is the unsigned distance function, bottom right is our, our function. And so you rotate out and let's see if this does it. So you rotate out and you can see that the bottom left is just this big mess. And we we're really unable to successfully get unsigned distance functions to train on these scenes and produce reconstructions. And the bottom left is just very, very difficult and just doesn't produce good results. But by making these two small changes of predicting a along a ray as opposed to the scene and doing this signing essentially the distance function, you can actually produce much better results. And this, these are the only changes between the methods. The other thing to, I wanna point out, because Nilesh did a lot of hard work, the baselines in this, in this work are extremely extensively tuned. We actually did much, but we sort of tried to improve upon all the other techniques in the literature. And we tried for every single technique, we tried multiple ways of producing the surfaces. Um, and it's still very, very true. Okay, so I'll just show some quality, some quantitative results. Um, so I don't wanna just show pictures. Um, we, the metrics we use, we evaluate on both all the points as well as the hidden points. And we use F1 score, which is like precision and recall combined together. but don't worry, we've tuned it so that F1 is meaningful. It's not that these are radically different recalls. Or we've, we've spent a lot of time tuning. One thing you can do is you can predict a bunch of layer depth maps. And this works OK, but the problem is it's very hard for the network to decide is the floor in depth map 2 or depth map 3. It's very hard for it to learn that. Um, you can do the, yeah. Uh, false plot. So it's going to be, for every single point, uh, it's like the uh, multi-view stereo accuracy and completeness. So yeah, exactly. Um, it's, basically, it's basically all your points within epsilon of a ground truth and is a ground truth point within epsilon of your, your predictions. The unsigned distance function also doesn't work that well. In fact, it does a little bit worse than predicting like four depth maps, which is kind of uh, sad. But if you actually force an unsigned distance function to be along the array, you get a pretty large improvement. So this is you know 4%, which is 
especially given the sort of relatively low performance to start with, this 4% is a very large relative improvement. If you use our technique, we get a much larger improvement. This consistently works better, and it works really well on the hidden surfaces. So we're really good at recovering hidden surfaces compared to the ground truth. And if you use RGBD, our, our new thing, which is under submission, you can actually get very, very close to just using the meshes. And in fact, I think we, if we tune it a little bit better, we can get naturally mesh supervision. And one thing to point out is the hidden performance, the hidden sort of scores, you see, you look at something, you say 25%. That doesn't sound that great. But what's actually happening is that a lot of the predictions are in other rooms. And so some fraction of this is surfaces that you could expect to see. So for example, the floor that's behind the podium, which you know is there. And you could totally expect to predict that. Some of it is predicting what's in the next room, which you can't necessarily do. And so this 27% is an average of those two scores, essentially. It's a, it's a mix of these. OK, so some conclusions. Um, if, you're in the, if you're predicting a distance function, I hope you should predict it along a way. This is a very generalized conclusion. This is a nice trick um, that we've learned. And the other thing, bigger picture, especially for the, the students who are working on projects like this, is you should look into what you're actually expecting the network to do. Because here, the, the pathological behavior is something that you can't overcome by just scaling up the data. You have to think about what the network is actually trying to do and work with it as opposed to just sort of saying, hey, let's put more data, more compute. Um, yes? Hallucinations in the hidden. I mean, uh, you are coming from uh, uh, Marshall's uh, group, and uh, you need some context, right? Where in the architecture is the context in order to get the, uh, the, the, the hidden? Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you for that question. The, the, so to put it basically, where is it? How, how on earth are you able to predict the, the floor um, behind this podium if, for example, the only, if the pixel doesn't actually show that floor? And what's happening is that the, the, bit, the backbone features from the network are going to be aggregating that context. So the backbone we're using is like a resident 18. So it's relatively small, but it, it has enough to aggregate the features. Um, um, the other big, bigger picture thing that I'm doing is basically trying to take these systems and build sy systems that will make RGBD cameras or RGB cameras sort of 3D sensors for lots of applications. So we're trying to do lots of different uh, problems in this space including things like, for example, taking two pictures with an unknown reconstruction, unknown relationship and producing a reconstruction. So here we have these two images. So this is like wide baseline stereo. And we're trying to do it with learning and we can produce reconstructions that look like this. So here's the fully automatic reconstruction. We, we figure out what the cameras are. We figure out the relative pose. We do the reconstruction all in one go. And bigger picture, I'm hoping in the next five years or so to start moving from you know, having a system for one image having systems for two images, having systems for millions of images, having systems that all automatically scale between these regimes. And so this is something I'm working towards. And so we're building techniques for, for example, handling the two image case. Um, and we're learning lots of stuff because a lot of stuff just doesn't work on wide baseline cases. Um, and so this is stuff that we're working on. Um, and part of this is, you know, we're trying to build techniques that would be useful for people in robotics. Um, but one of the big questions I think is important for vision and machine learning right now is who can work with computer vision and machine learning? And the classic answer for me had always been robotics. Another classic answer is healthcare. And I'm working on this right now with one of my students who's co-advised with Jenna Weens. We're working on healthcare for chest x-ray diagnosis. But these are the classic answers. And I think we can think much more broadly because I think computer vision is in a position to work really nicely with other fields. So I'm gonna talk briefly about my work in solar physics and then evolutionary ecology, two things that you probably wouldn't have associated with computer vision um, you know, probably a week ago. So solar physics I, is kind of this, this very interesting thing. It's something that is extremely important that people tend not to talk too much about. Um, extreme space weather is one of just sort of two national level threats that have been recognized by FEMA. And stuff like solar flares, corona mass ejections. Does anyone have any idea about what the other national level threat is? Somehow all around us and People often don't know what to guess. What's the other national level threat that FEMA has figured out? Like something that can shut down the entire nation for like a year or two. It's COVID. It's pandemic. And so solar weather is sort of put in the same level of threat. It's, this is above stuff like volcanoes and massive hurricanes because it can affect the entire nation. So what people do is they, they observe the sun using, and one of the big things that generates a lot of this, this extreme space weather is the magnetic field of the sun. And so here, for example, is a magnetogram that's generated by one of uh, a NASA instrument. And so people spend, you have immense amounts of data, like decades at very, very high cadence, really high quality science data. And people actually pay for space weather forecasts, which is amazing because this affects satellite planning. It's, it's really actually a 
whole side of the world that I had no idea about. And these magnetograms that people produce are the foundation for a lot of the space weather pipeline. So you get these images of the magnetic field of the sun, and people use them for boundary conditions for models. So people have gigantic, basically gigantic differential equation models. And you need boundary conditions for the sun. And these are the boundary conditions they use. And people use them for features, for flare forecasting, lots and lots of other fun stuff. And this is like this foundational data product that people use. And the way that you get um, uh, magnetograms, and so you can leave afterwards, you can now have some sense of how the magnetograms get produced. The key idea is that you're going to disentangle the Zeeman effect from a couple of other factors. And to, the, to anyone with a physics background, I apologize. This is a dramatic oversimplification. I'm happy to talk about the actual details. But here's a general gist. The idea is that the sun actually produces light in lots of different wavelengths. There are spectral lines. And there's one spectral line which occurs in the photosphere. And it's actually this precise, well, maybe not precise due to projectors, but it says approximately this nice orange color. And this is produced by an ion in the photosphere. And what happens is you measure this at some absurdly precise wavelength. So this is the measurements that you're doing are extremely high precision. And if you crank up the magnetic field to about 3,000 Gauss, the spectral line splits into a triplet. And people pick which, which line they observe specifically to get good results. Um, and it splits by very, very, very slight amounts. So you have to do high precision measurement in space. With radiation hardened hardware, it's, very, it's all very exciting. The problem is actually the, the sun doesn't stay still. And the sun is actually rotating. For example, it might be rotating away from you at around two kilometers a second. And so what does this cause? This is causes redshift. And so the redshift, the line shift over. And you're making these very slight measurements in space and stuff is moving very fast. And so actually stuff like redshift and um, the, the Zeeman effect actually uh, are very kind of complicated to disentangle. And so, but what you, you can in fact disentangle them and get actually quite precise measurements. So what people do is they have an, a satellite. So this is a solar dynamics observatory. Um, and it has an instrument called HMI that measures the magnetic field. And you get the Stokes vector per wavelength using band passes that are separated by like something like, uh, I think around 10th or like 100th of a nanometer. This is really, really, really precision measurement. And then you figure out the magnetic field that would cause the observations you get. And this is something called Stokes, uh, Stokes inversion. And it's an optimization technique. And you basically do an optimization for every single pixel to figure out what, what matches your observations. The problem is this takes a very long amount of time. And it's very difficult to actually control the modeling of this and to adjust it. Because actually, for example, if you have an artifact in the data, you actually have to do tons and tons of inversions to actually get um, the information needed to fix the artifact. So this is actually quite slow because you're doing an optimization for every single pixel again and again. So we started out. And what you might expect is the first thing we tried to do is we did a deep learning based inversion. And there's lots of details of how to get this to actually work. Some stuff in internet vision just doesn't transfer to the solar physics domain. But the upshot is you can produce results that are like 100 times faster. It's accurate. You get confidence intervals, sort of something, something approaching uncertainty quantification. And it's actually quite accurate. So let me just show you some outputs. So here are some, some pictures. So here's what the pipeline produces. And you can see that actually most of the sun is extremely boring. Most of it, there's no magnetic field. Um, here's our output. Now, of course, you can't see the difference because it's, you know, we're too far out. So let's zoom in on a sunspot. And what happens is that our outputs, if you stare at these long enough, you can spot that the, the true, the pipeline produces something which is the magnetic field slightly stronger. Ours is a little weaker. Um, but you can see that the, qualitatively, the results actually look quite nice and quite, quite similar. And the, the key is that the thing on the right is produced about 100 times faster. You can also produce other properties like the inclination of the magnetic field. So uh, as a PhD student, I worked on surface normal estimation. And I said, ah, I don't want to do surface normal estimation anymore. But then after starting as a professor, I said, oh, let's, let's do actually estimating stuff that's roughly like a surface normal. And so you can get the inclination angle of the field. And so now I'm back to my original problems. And the, the outputs look quite similar. So I'm not going to talk about the actual evaluation. I promise we did much more thorough evaluation than this. The physicists are extremely rigorous. And they're really exacting. And it's, I've learned a lot about how do you do precision measurement, which I think is important because computer vision, especially 3D, is getting to the point where actually we're trying to do precision measurement. Yeah. We, we, we did not do that. The, um, we are currently working on stuff. So we, we tend, tend to have enough data that we don't need to do augmentation. Um, and because the process is relatively well enough constrained. So we don't do a lot of. Oh, question online. Oh, yes. Please go ahead. Oh. 
Oh. Oh, I got it. Okay. Hello, you should be able to talk. I think I got it. I don't think we can hear you if you're speaking. Uh, am I allowed to say anything? Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you. This is a wonderful talk. Um, music to my ear um, because it's very quantitative and it's not this if, then, and however, and nevertheless. However, I have several questions. One of the key questions that I missed in your talk is to talk about calibration. I know it's not popular with the neural net crowd, but if you really want to get quantitative information from the non-contact observation, you have to have a very rigorous calibration of the whole chain of data capture. You haven't said very much about it, but I am sure your physics colleagues have emphasized that. So tell me, have you done that? Yes, this is, this is a wonderful question. Um, I, I love Thank talking you. about calibration. Um, so in the 3D part, uh, I will say that we are training and testing on stuff which has the same focal length and is so that removes some of the ambiguities. Now, if you want to go out to the real world of internet images, you will have to do calibration. And we, I'm seeing that as orthogonal because there are lots of great papers from other people about that type of calibration for 3D. For um, the sun, yes, the calibration is incredibly important. So in fact, it's, uh, so I can't talk about the spectral calibration because there's tons of stuff and it's really, amazing work that's done on the ground and then actually in flight as well they wait for certain observations uh, but i do actually i actually use some of the techniques from 3d computer vision to actually fix some of the spatial calibration of their telescope so actually because once you send a thing up you can't go and you can't have someone do the checkerboard dance near venus to try to calibrate your telescopes david, and so we actually I, david i i honestly think it's so important to impress upon our students this point, because somehow there is this myth for last four or five years. And I know you were at Berkeley and Berkeley is one of as guilty as, as everybody else, is that, that somehow you don't need calibration, that the data will magically supplement all the information that otherwise you would. But in this physics-based applications, it's obviously very important. The other thing I wanted to ask you, and then I shut up. I'm sorry, I am, I'm at home with flu, so I can't really come to see you in person. Um, the other question I have is that in your initial talk, when you are reconstructing the three-dimensional scene, um, you kind of, uh, you didn't say explicitly what are your assumptions. For example, you, you made a lot of utility of the fact that you are dealing with planar surfaces. Reconstructing planar surfaces, as we know, is rather easy. Um, the other thing I would love to see somebody do, maybe not you, but some of your students, is a comparison. There is a long history, including my own work, in um, three-dimensional reconstruction from monocular depth skews, um, as well as from binocular depth skews. So, of course, you have focused on binocular, but as I said, the human eye uses both and there is a lot of literature on that, both from psychology as well as from machine crazy people like me who try to do that. Yeah, I, I, I can briefly talk about the, uh, the assumptions. There are relatively few assumptions that go in. Um, so in the planar work that I showed right before the physics 
the, there is an assumption of planar, planarity, which is very limiting. In the first part of producing the distance functions, there's, there's not an assumption <coughs> about anything specific about, um, there's no explicit assumption. Now, it doesn't necessarily work on thin structures, uh, because what happens is if your uncertainty is bigger than the distance between the surfaces, uh, the surfaces get blurred. And for the binocular stuff, I think this is very exciting because one of the things that I'm very interested in is how can you start taking, injecting the binocular data in a way where it doesn't just simply consist of use binocular data. So here, binocular could be either stereo pairs right. or right. generally like LIDAR or any active sensor. The, the temptation has always been you take that as ground truth and you kind of <coughs> fill in the rest with monocular cues. But I think the, the possibility of having this learning-based system might enable it to actually learn to use a binocular cues in a clever way and actually learn to reject them if they're, for example, incorrect. Like specular surfaces, you probably don't want to use a classic stereo algorithm. Um, but I think this is something where I'm, where I'm headed towards and I, I think will be kind of the future of monocular vision, as well as also, I think, the possibly, uh, without possibly causing too much of a ruckus, possibly the future as well of doing multi-view stuff will include really the monocular cues, the cues just that are available from pictures as just a, a base thing that you always have. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. No, that, thank you for these wonderful questions. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about calibration. Um, so one of the things that happens though with the, the physics that I want to also talk about with calibration and other things is that artifacts are, are extremely important. And so if you actually look at the average of certain quantities, you can plot them over the day. If you look at the next day, they actually you have the same pattern appear. And the calibration is important, but sometimes you don't always get it right. And then if it's up in space, you can't like say, bring it back down and then recalibrate it. And if you actually look at the, the, this pipeline, this instrument it actually produces a very, very large, this daily oscillation, which is a huge pain and really messes up models. Um, our system is able to actually recover this oscillation quite nicely, which is quite exciting. You would think, why is it great that you can recover the artifact? But if you can recover the artifact, then you should be able to correct it a lot faster because our system is 100 times faster. So the other thing you can do is you can fix the artifact. And so if you have another instrument, you have lots of different missions that serve different purposes. You can train a deep network to go from one to the other. And so this is actually quite nice. You can build a best of both worlds virtual instrument that has the aspects of both. So the other instrument we're using is a much higher spectral precision instrument, but it captures a limited field of view. And this is a, this is a system that we're actually trying to now deploy. Yes. Yeah, the supervision signal is you have a, um, you have a, a physical pipeline which solves an optimization process. And then you essentially jump, rather than solve the optimization problem, you jump to the solution. And the trick with this, actually the one that's running right now, is that the optimization process runs on much better inputs from a different instrument that you can sort of co-align with the data. And so you can produce essentially better answers that you can, you can because the optimization, you're inverting one pixel at a time. So you can't necessarily get great answers if you have a low quality instrument. But if you have a high quality instrument observed at the same location, all of a sudden you can get a much better answer. Yes, it is inter-instrument consistently. So you can get uh, quite a bit better results. And to get to Rosanna's question about calibration, and then I'll take your question. One of the things which is very surprising was I actually had a first author paper where we recalibrated their, their telescopes. And you, you would be very surprised that it was, it was actually using SIFT plus RANSAC and actually substantially improved the, like a, a, a decade long bug that they had essentially. Yes. In space and, and or yeah. why that, why a hundred times faster is, is necessary. Yeah, okay, so um, it's, uh, so the comparison is uh, a CPU versus a GPU type stuff. So this GPU is certainly helping with this. Um, the big problem with a lot of these science pipelines is that you have a very small number of people who understand how they operate. And so you actually need an expert who can do Stokes inversion. This is not something you can get, uh, you can get a person. So their, their pipelines tend to be science quality and they're not necessarily operations quality. And so they have very complicated pipelines that are, they don't want to touch because of the calibration. Because if you touch it, then you might get new artifacts. Um, it's not being done in space. What the actually happens is the satellite is in a weird 24 hour oscillation, uh, 24 hour, uh, sorry, not, is in a weird geosynchronous orbit, which causes actually this 24 hour oscillation. And um, the, the data is then sent down because it's in a geosynchronous orbit. It sends down about a terabyte a day, which is then processed on a CPU cluster. And the reason why the 100 times X is good is because you can't actually do a lot of interesting things, like for example, correct for the artifacts. 
Because to get the signal of, for example, have I removed this oscillation, you might have to run something, you might have to do like a day's worth of compute essentially to get one function evaluation step. And so it's very, very, quite a bit tricky. Um, that's where essentially the, uh, having the fast proxy is actually very helpful. So I'm gonna jump next to a little bit about evolutionary ecology where we also speed things up. So in ecology, your data points are, for example, specimens from uh, birds. And one data point is, for example, might take 15 to 30 minutes to measure. And this is because you have to use digital calipers and it's very painful. These bones are very, very small. And so we built a system called Skelevision, which can accelerate things by a uh, factor of 15 or 30. And so you can basically casually dump a bird skeleton. It takes a picture with just basic assumptions and the fact that the bird skeletons are quite small, you can actually measure things easily. And so you can take an image like this and you can convert it. Essentially, you can segment things out. Um, and this is very nice because all of a sudden you can um, measure things quite fast. And so we're actually sort of zoom out. And so I'm gonna show you what a person can do in approximately a day. And so this, you know, running 25 images through a deep net, that's very fast. And dumping the bones onto a plate, that's very fast. That can be done in an hour with our system. But this is a day's worth of work. If you actually zoom out to like say two weeks worth of work for a, a trained lab tech, this is, this is sort of like what you can get. And you can see like, you can still see the pictures. This is not a lot of data. So if you actually zoom all the way out, we're gonna zoom out all the way to like, um, just a tenth of what we're able to collect in like, I think it's approximately like two weeks maybe. And so this is just one tenth of the data that you're able to collect. But this is something where if you do it the traditional way, if you wanna get a thousand measurements, and still this is a thousand is actually not a lot if you wanna do real statistics on this. This is just impossible. And so we built the system, we're currently trying to scale it up. And it's one of these things where just like picking the right problem, you can make things a lot better for your biologist friends. And now they can test stuff like all sorts of classic rules that people really haven't tested at scale because you can't just get like $2 million to hire people to measure bird skeletons. And so this is, I think, one area where computer vision, if you can sort of knock an order of magnitude off, you can unlock new, new challenges. Okay, so some takeaways. One of the things I learned is a close collaboration is needed for success. Um, and it's collaboration as opposed to sort of jumping in and writing one paper and announcing solar vision or bird skeletons are solved. And I think the interesting thing will be like, computer vision plus X is really, I think, very interesting. And the question can be like, what can X be for this? Some of the stuff I'm looking to do is like unifying 3D with solar physics. So the sun is actually a 3D object. Um, I'm looking about to do this. And then inter-instrument calibration, actually, and unifying this sort of constellation of instruments over time is, I think, very interesting. Um, and this is something where, you know, you can't just go to the internet and collect more solar physics data. You have a small number of instruments that are very well understood. It's a very different regime compared to internet video. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly sort of just jump through the last bit, which is trying to understand interaction. This is just gonna give a very high level to give you a flavor of what I'm interested in. Um, I've talked about um, a little bit about 3D, about how the world is. And I, you know, I wanna also think about how the world could be. And so you know you could interact with the refrigerator and open things up. So one of the things I've been interested in is understanding the interactive world by watching people manipulate it. So I've been interested in this for probably now a decade. And we're able to build models of things in 3D um, but the thing that I've learned throughout this entire thing is 3D is nice, but observing what people do with their hands is the key. And so I've been building systems that can understand what people are doing with their hands, often for very basic reasons, for basic sort of outputs. And so one system we built is just a system that you can produce um, understandings of the, the, where the hands are, what objects they're touching without naming them, just putting a box around them. And people use this for all sorts of stuff in robotics. Um, uh, someone from kinesiology was talking to me about using it. This is kind of very basic, but having a system that just works is very interesting because it enables your collaborators and people in other areas to actually do very, very interesting uh, techniques. So this is like an enabling technology. And one way we've been trying to expand this is you scale it up by annotating lots and lots of data. So we have a paper with uh, Dima Damon and Sonia Fiddler and, and all of their students who are doing really great work. And we just scale this up by annotating lots and lots and lots and lots of data. So you have a gigantic annotation team doing gigantic amounts of data. And so we can scale things up this way and we build these build big video models um, or these big video data sets. And so this is, these, are, these are annotations that have been interpolated. There's just tons and tons and tons and tons of data. And you have um, can to object contact relations. So we have lots and lots of great data. And so that's one solution. But it's not really satisfying because the answer is just annotate. So we've been working in my lab on learning from video. And so the idea is you can watch what people do on the internet or in Epic Kitchens or all these other things. And you can learn um, how the world works by watching people. 
And rather than having people annotate, you have people move stuff so that you can learn from the video. And the specific task that we're working on is you want to be able to figure out what people are holding. And so we have like a, um, a query point. And you want to be able to do things like segment, for example, the hands and the, and the book that the person is holding. And the basic idea is that we're going to have information about optical flow and human pixels at training time. And this will generate some pseudo labels for a system. And I'm just going to show you the, the general idea. Um, and I, I'm happy to talk more about the actual details offline. And the idea is that our network is going to produce some features. And we're going to find supervision for those features using optical flow and human pixels. And so the flow provides information about common fate. So this is just the idea that objects that move together belong together. This is a classic idea going back to the Gestalt psychologists. You also have information about humans because humans are the things that move things in scenes, especially egocentric video. And together, these help provide organization for your feature space. They tell you what your deep network should produce. And the, we have a paper which we just submitted which has a really, really simple idea. And we try to, for example, take features and we predict whether the features are going to move together. And we just have a network that is trained to do that based on the features. And the signal for this is really simple. You fit a fundamental matrix to ransack. And you find the error with respect to that. You find stuff that isn't explained by the scene motion. And then you can find stuff like connecting components. And this is a bad signal for any individual frame. But on average, if you train over lots and lots of data, this will actually provide information about which pixels tend to move together. Because at some point, people pick up an object, and those pixels move consistently. And so you're providing a signal to organize the feature space. The other thing you can do is you can use information about hands. Hands in these egocentric videos are, tend to be the only pixels that correspond to people. And so you can, you can provide a signal of these things are moving together and one of them is a hand. So this provides some signal. Yeah. Uh, two views of the video. Yeah, so you have, you have, a, you have a short uh, space of, um, you, know, you have a couple, like half a second. And so you fit a fundamental matrix. Uh, between those two frames. And the assumption there is that most of the stuff is not moving. Um, and so you can, of course, make better versions. But for Epic Kitchens, this actually is good enough, which was quite surprising to me. Um, and once you've learned from video, you can do lots of stuff. So you can actually cluster the features. And you can use standard clustering techniques, which is very surprising to us. It just works off the shelf, and you get reasonable clusters. You can also take the pixel, and you can take all the other pixels, and you can ask, does this hand and this object move together, essentially? And you get outputs of the predicted association, which, is, which works quite nicely. And you can also do some cleaning up where you take the clusters, you average things. You can, you can clean this up quite nicely. You can also do this with another pixel. You can pick another pixel on another hand. You get predicted associations. And this is, again, supervised just by watching videos. And so this is quite fun. Um, I'm just going to just very briefly then wrap up. Um, show you some results. We can you know, associate hands with objects and sort of segment things out kind of nicely, which is nice. This is, again, unsupervised. So it's not going to be quite the same outputs that you get if you train on you know, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 masks. But these are, these are learned from video, which is kind of fun. And I think one interesting thing will be how do you combine this great supervision from humans with sort of weaker supervision from videos. And as a sort of output, one of the things that we're doing is you can actually take video data sets we have just boxes, and we're trying to convert them into segments. Um, and this is, this is very similar to a lot of work that, for example, John Bo is doing, where the question is, how can you use a small amount of really good supervision, and how do you most effectively use humans to provide the supervision? Providing the boxes is relatively easy, and the segments should really be provided by video or maybe a small amount of stuff. So to conclude, um, today I've talked about three things, going from RGB to full 3D. And the key here is analyzing what to expect um, your networks to do. I've talked about, about vision for science, and here the, the secret sauce is really actually collaboration. Um, we have to work very hard to understand the actual problems. And finally, I talked a little bit about understanding RGB uh, images and, and hands, and sort of producing hands from, uh, from these uh, videos. And the key here was either labeling, or in the future, we'll be using stuff like common fate and other cues to, to basically get away from annotating every single pixel in the video. So with that, I'm, I'm uh, sort of that's it for, for me. But I'm happy to take any more questions that people have. We have uh, two panelists, or just you? Are you and somebody else? And Lingji? Okay. I think the questions uh, will be uh, read uh, from the panelists, or you have to go around here with the microphone. Yeah, I think we 
Hey, David, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, um, it's very interesting talk. Um, I definitely very uh, interesting in your like high level um, topics about, you know, learning physics of our visual world beyond the, I guess, the uh, the surface understanding like uh, simulation or, you know, uh, or in a recognition in general. So my question is, I, I'm curious about your perspective on, you know, uh, what's the next step if we, you know, really want to learning beyond the, you know, the the first layer of understanding, like segmentation? If we, for example, if we want to, you know, understand the physical properties, how we can interact with some kind of objects or in the environment, because um, this this problem, I have been thinking about this problem uh, in, a lot in the past, but it's it's like it's like very unclear to me how we can approach this if we even if we want to collect some data you know, with some supervision, right? It's sometimes hard to collect. So I wonder um, if you have any, you know, ideas about how to approach this potentially in the unsupervised way and and potentially we can scale up also. Yeah, this is a really great question. I think, because I think this is in some sense the million or billion dollar question. Like how do you go beyond and what are the problems you work on? I think, so one of the things that I've learned is I think figuring out who can benefit from what you do is very important. And I think, so, so for me, talking with roboticists, talking with physicists, talking with people who are the downstream users of stuff I do has been very important because you can often find a proxy problem that people are interested in. And so for me, at least, um, what happened with, for example, the hands in the interaction is I realized that a lot of people were doing interesting things with hands. There were things that worked primarily in the lab and they couldn't work in the wild because of a missing gap. And I think for computer vision, for going beyond this segmenting things or generating pictures of cats in spacesuits, I think the big thing will be trying to identify in collaboration with people, what are the things people need and what are the quantities you want to have measured? And so for me, the thing that I've become interested in is asking people, what could I measure for you that would make a difference? Mm -hmm. And so I think in the case of action, the problem is, I think, and this is why it's a billion dollar question is, I think it's not clear to me what the interesting question for action is. So one of the things that I'm interested in would be, uh, could you, for example, make reinforcement learning style interaction with the world faster by telling people roughly where people uh, interact with stuff? And so that's one downstream application of the hands. And you can imagine that there are lots of other ways where you could learn, for example, interaction spots for where people might interact, or for example, general plans for how, how people might interact with an object. But I, I wish I knew the answer to that question, but those are sort of some preliminary ideas for how to do it. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, building uh, like uh, uh, using geometric constraints uh, in order to make inference in the world. Uh, for example, uh, detecting hands by uh, 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 grouping outliers. On the other hand, though, how we have uh, tons of semantically annotated images. Can they help the other way? So to impose more regularization on the uh, reconstructions. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is a very clever direction and that's something I'm interested in. So what in my, in my work so far, with, especially with hands, what I've done primarily has been, I focused on the strongly supervised case where we annotate everything. The solution is the challenge is how do you annotate stuff? And it's, it's very easy if you haven't done annotation before. I think it's, oh, you just, you just send the data to some company, they annotate. The challenge is figuring out how do you annotate, what do you annotate, the specific problem, and how do you formulate it? This is very, very challenging. So we've worked on that. We've worked on the unsupervised case. But what I think would be very interesting is if you start out knowing a little bit about some objects, how do you go to the work? For example, maybe you have really bad examples of, for example, spoons. Like you have the sort of two clean examples where you can get some annotation very easily. How do you then go off to like Epic Kitchens and that should help for example, provide better understanding of like the grouping in the, you have some outliers from, for example, flow. That should help constrain things. But also I think what's interesting is you can't really, we have lots of great semantic annotations, but if you start watching people interact with the world naturally and you sort of count which objects you touch in your day, all of a sudden you realize that there are tons and tons of categories that are just not covered. And if you just watch these videos, the number of basic entry level nouns is enormous. So the question might be, how do you take the, common objects like something like Coco or Elvis, the video so that people actually just have to pick up the object briefly. And how do you actually use them to regularize? And I think that would be a very fascinating direction. And you can imagine that maybe you have 
if you train the network the right way, you can kind of force it to make predictions on stuff it hasn't seen before. And by watching the video, you can then, you can then improve it, improve those estimates. Ask you whether you have sound. You say, no, there's no sound. <laughs> so I'm not going to ask you that question. So uh, for a lot of the video, it comes with sound. And for a lot of physical interaction, you have sound, right? So if you take sound out, the video seems to lose a lot of the values. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, I agree. So actually, one of the things I, I was super interested in, I feel as if this is, someone runs off with this project and does it, I'd be very happy. Um, and I've, I wouldn't feel scooped. I'd be. If you think about contact, one of the big challenges with contact is recognize when contact occurs. And deep networks love to cheat. If I say, if I have, uh, and my apologies to those who are watching this at home, you probably can't see this very well. But I have a cup, for example, and I put my hand right next to the cup. Deep networks love to say my hand is in contact with the cup because it's really, it's very hard to distinguish because actually you have to look at, for example, the shadows and where the shadows and the cup. This is too hard for a deep network. The deep network is lazy. But if, let's see if I can do this. If you make contact, the sound tells you exactly when the contact happens. And this is people, you, you exploit this trick actually in like astronomy, for example, you get like two signals and you can, you can do all sorts of interesting experiments that way. And even, for example, like if I put the cup down, this tells me exactly when it lands. And I think, I think this is very interesting. It's just, it's a little bit challenging because you have to separate it out, like you and I know, that's the cup touching. But separating it out from the sound seems very hard. Um, but if, if I had more time. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, David. Thank you a lot for your talk. It's really interesting. And uh, I'm personally very interested in uh, building like pre-trained model for robotics. And uh, But as we all know, like in robotics, we don't have a lot of data. But here, uh, as you, you have shown that uh, from human videos, we can get a lot of like diverse, large scale uh, in the wild data. So uh, I guess I have two questions. The first is, um, I was wondering for the uh, the last, last part of your talk, you talked about the supervised and unsupervised way of detecting contacts in terms of segmentation or uh, hand object relation. I was wondering how well that works uh, in the like zero shot in the wild. Uh, I guess I was wondering if you could speak about that. Yeah, basically, if I understand the question correctly, it's basically how well do these works? How well does, if I take the stuff and I move it out of, a, out of the data set, how well does it work? This is, this is my favorite question uh, because when I, I, when I work with robotics people, what they always ask, like, okay, fine, 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 fine. I see this on Flickr. It doesn't work on the, the real world. This is exciting because it's like, okay, here's a challenge I can figure out. If I can get this to work in the real world, I can have impact. And so the hand object type stuff, it actually works quite well. Um, and the, the secret sauce is really just having lots and 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 lots of data here. So that's in the case of the, just this purely supervised thing, it's getting lots of data from lots of different configurations. And in YouTube, for example, there's large amounts of data that is just from lots of different people, from lots of different backgrounds, doing lots of different things. And actually the secret sauce really, that I think in the annotation, in, the, in, the, in that project, in the supervised one, the thing that makes it work actually relatively well, and you should definitely try it. I'd love to, we'd love to see failure modes because if we see a failure mode, we're like, oh, that's interesting. We can fix that maybe. The secret, I think, is actually video. It's not something specifically from YouTube. I think if you get general video, this is very good. Because when I take a photo, most of the time when I take a photo, everyone, everyone freezes. They're like, okay, I need to smile, look at the camera. But with video, video, you can't freeze for a video. So what happens is photos are extremely staged. But videos, they capture these random moments. And these random moments is specifically what happens with goes wrong with like robots. Robots, you can't have say the first thing I need you to do to interact with me is to pose characteristically when I'm opening a fridge. If you look at how people open fridges in MS Coco, it's ridiculous, it, like, it doesn't make sense. But if you watch videos, this is much more natural. And that I think is a secret. Um, so those stuff, so long story short, the techniques that we've developed for the supervised things work quite well in the wild. And I'd love for you to try them. Uh, and actually, if you have failure modes, I'd love to see them actually. Um, the, Self-supervised stuff is a bit more of a um, mixed bag in the sense that sometimes it will work. And by mixed bag, I mean, we're testing it on totally different data. Sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it produces sort of less good results.
But the key with self-supervised stuff is that you can, you can train, if it doesn't work on something, you can often train in that domain. And that's, I think, where uh, you can imagine that, you know, if you change the camera and the camera resolution is different, well, just retrain. Um, just watch some more videos. If the lighting is different, well, just watch more videos. And so, um, but I'd love to see if you try it. I'd love to see what happens. Um, yeah, I've actually tried um, one of your methods, 100 days of pan. Yes. Uh, and then it works decent well in the in, in some of the in the wild data set. But I guess a follow up on that is that uh, I feel maybe there's a newer method that you have published in that area, but that method only takes, uh, as you said, I think video is very important, but that method takes per frame image, right? Yeah. I, was, I was just wondering if some like important information in terms of video is being lost in that method. Perhaps there's future like like improvements in this direction of supervised learning. I totally agree. Because what we expect, so when I did this paper, I thought people would try this on frames of videos or like random images. And what actually happens is I think a very large fraction of the consumers are just like you. They, they want to use the video. And the signal is really, there's tons of signal there because if you want to, for example, figure out, is my hand actually touching the cuff? Because for a network from a single image, it's too hard. But if you actually watch the whole sequence, you should be able to figure out when you actually touch the cup because it, once you stop touching, you can sort of figure out, like, you can't keep on moving towards the cup past touching the cup. So that's a very powerful constraint, which we don't use. Um, we don't have anything in the pipeline to do video, but I'm always trying to get a student to try this. And I think recently one of my students expressed interest in actually something about actually analyzing a whole video, which I'm very excited about. But we do have something coming out hopefully soon. It's a project in the works, which should... Um, Fix a couple of the other issues with the system, but video. I'm glad to hear videos of interest. So maybe I can I can push a student <laughs> to uh, say, "Hey, people ask me about video. Do you want to try video?" Uh, thanks for your answer. And my my last question is: uh, sometimes in robotics, uh, like agents, uh, objects interaction is important, but also objects and object interaction. Like, is my this object touching the other object? So I guess we talked a lot about like hand object relations. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on like, in terms of context, right? Like objects and objects touching each other. Yeah, this is a, this is a super interesting problem. I don't have any thoughts on that specifically one, but the one thing that, uh, and there's a paper from Genbo's group that has, that talks about like these second order interactions, which I think are very interesting. We have, you know, I don't know, this is not exactly the best example, but you have, for example, the eraser touching the, this cuff. And people, because people use, Tools like the one of the most important things people use objects for are tools to extend your essentially basically make new hands. And I think this is an interesting area, given that the hand to one object seems to work okay. I think this is a, a next step. It's like how do you deal with tools because that I think will be very important. But I, I don't see that th th there you can get a lot of good supervision because you can actually you could watch this from video to figure out. But knowing the object to object contacts. Seems a little trickier to get from natural supervision. I mean, you could annotate a data set, but it would be much more interesting if you could just learn it from video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, David, thank you very much for the great talk. Let us uh, thank the speaker again. Wish you everybody uh, holidays. Uh, um, we'll meet again in uh, January. <laughs>